the craft is timeless and it goes beyond written words. It goes beyond history. Its essence is deeply rooted in lore, legend, story, and myth. Traditionally, it was said that the craft passed its wisdom down orally. Unfortunately, storytelling has become somewhat of a lost art in our modern age. Children rely on video games and television, movies, computers for their entertainment. And those things are fine. We're not saying that they're bad, but those devices can't replace the experience of a bedtime story or reading instead of watching. See, in storytelling and in reading, the listener is left to imagine the visuals for themselves. They create that experience in their own mind. And that's something that doesn't exist when those visuals are already provided for you in things like video games, television, and movies. So that imaginative process is atrophied as a result of that. And that imaginative process is essential to magic. Oral learning, like storytelling, was the way that myths and legends used to be taught, and it remains an integral part of magic as practiced by many witches. Understanding the power of visualization is so vital when you are studying magic. And we'll go into that more in depth in other lessons, but just suffice it to say that listening to stories and reading stories, especially those with a lot of imagery like fairy tales, is an amazing way of increasing your ability to visualize rather than using cold visualization exercises, which are often taught in many of the metaphysical and magical trainings. Visualize a blue ball. Visualize a red triangle. That isn't as effective for many of us as just listening to a story because then you automatically and organically start to exercise that part of the imagination that creates images for yourself. Magic is a craft. And if you think of other crafts like painting or acting or songwriting, it requires mastery, it requires practice, and it requires structure. Developing solid magical technique is essential. It takes years of dedication to perform great works of magic. But with some effort and persistence, very satisfactory results can be achieved in a short time. So before we move any further into all of this, I want to clarify that I'm speaking from my own experience within my own craft and my own practice. It's important to note that other people that talk about the craft may have very different ways of expressing and teaching these concepts. And I'm not here to speak for the craft as a whole, and nobody can speak for the craft as a whole. We can only share our own perspectives, our own understandings, and our own experiences. So this is my way. This is the way I look at things. But it's never intended to be presented as the way. So let's explore how some ancient principles are still practiced by many witches in modern day. In this world, we recognize there's duality in everything. In this world, there is always an up and a down. There's always an in and an out, a right and a left, a male and a female, a light and a dark. And we think of these as complementary things because we understand that the three-dimensional world is just an illusion. And that's why magic is possible, because since it's an illusion, it's malleable. So we understand and work within that illusion, and work within those complementary forces, We don't see them as many religions do, as opposing forces of good and evil. Instead, we are more akin to the points of view that look at these forces as yin and yang. Most people that are involved in the craft look at the concept of duality as being a partnership rather than a warring faction. We see life as a dance where the male and female, or as we say, god and goddess, empower each other and complement each other, continually moving and creating with one another, a dance that we all participate in. Another concept that differs from a lot of religious practices and teachings is the idea that spirit is not somewhere outside of us. 
In fact, spirit or infinite intelligence, God, goddess, manifests through us. We are responsible for this dance of life ourselves. The craft doesn't wait for some external deity to come and rescue us, and we don't necessarily expect that everything's just going to be better in the next world. We understand that this is it, and we are responsible. The more we take responsibility for things in this world and the things in our lives, the more motivated we are to get going and to get working and to make things better and to improve things in ways that we can. And we understand that there is a higher intelligence and that it does guide us, but it doesn't guide us from outside of us. It guides us from within us because this higher intelligence is connected to a higher part of ourselves. And that higher part of ourselves is a place where all minds join and we are all one. Many people in the craft practice more of what's called pantheism where we comprehend that divinity is everywhere, in everyone. Pan meaning all. We don't have to search in special places necessarily to find divinity. Many witches tend to be ecologists. We take our power and put it into perspective and understand that we're responsible for stewarding this earth, that we're responsible for the impact that we as humans have upon the earth. Our worldview is that it is up to us, and it's through us that any kind of higher power can make a difference. We take responsibility for any of the messes that we as a species are making, and we are at the forefront of helping to clean those messes up. When we invoke a deity, we're not summoning some external force. We are calling forth a deeper experience of the forces that are always and have always been a part of us. In the craft, work is play. We find that we are most productive when we approach our magical operations from a child's point of view. Not childish, but childlike. We've discovered that within everyone there is a child who is naturally in touch with its own divinity, just as each and every one of us were when we first departed the womb. It is this child self that we evoke in magic. Psychologists attribute the function of the child self to the right hemisphere of the brain. And it's important to realize that we don't bring forth the child self at the expense of the parent self, or left side of the brain. Instead, we allow the dance of duality to balance those two as well, in harmony. We understand that our intuitive nature is useless in this world unless it has appropriate channels of experience and expression through which it can operate. This is the job of that parent self, to lovingly supervise and oversee and care for the child. This child-parent relationship is apparent in the human psyche, regardless of whether one is practicing witchcraft or not. Yet with all the abuse, dysfunction, codependency, etc. in most of our backgrounds, it's no surprise that most people move through their life suppressing at best or mistreating at worst the child self with the parent self. In magic, it's extremely important to heal the relationship that we have between the child and parent self, and often that comes through finding forgiveness with our own parents and our own children, because those are reflections of that same dynamic. As children at play in the craft, we use poetry perfumes, candles, costumes, colors, dancing, music, chanting, art, imagery, to get our magic flowing. We allow that parent logical side to take all of that and focus and give it form and apply it practically. The child is the inspiration behind the magic, and the parent then is the structure. Magic is both an intuitive and pragmatic art. In nature, there are no straight lines, 
every grain of sand, every tree, blade of grass, feather, rock, possesses unique curves and swirls. The only straight lines that exist are those that are created by human beings. Nature is flexible. She breathes. She moves. She changes. If you think of the craft as a religion, its teacher is nature. One of the first lessons we learn in the craft is to let go of our own straight lines. Nature is a symphony of cycles, and we as witches always tap into these cycles. We recognize that the cycles of nature are not outside of us. They make us up. We celebrate the phases of the moon, the seasons, and the phases and seasons of our bodies, minds, emotions, and lives. The concept of cycles is prevalent in the craft, particularly in our perception of birth and death. Reincarnation, or some variation of it, makes practical sense to many people in the craft. Many believe in the immortality of the spirit. The spirit, the core essence of ourselves, cannot be destroyed. It is eternal, and many witches perceive the physical world as a university or a preschool, depending on one's perspective. And with each rebirth, we embark on a new level of learning. Regarding the truth of reincarnation, I cannot say for certain whether reincarnation is a real thing or not. However, I have personally had out-of-body experiences where I discovered that my identity transcends my physical body, and I've also had past life memories which seem so real to me and have convinced me that I have existed in other bodies and other lifetimes. But this is not a belief that's necessarily held by all people who practice the craft, and it's not a prerequisite for practicing it. In my opinion, the reason why we lack clear, natural recall of our past lives has to do with trauma. Trauma often suppresses memories for most individuals. Birth and death are among the most profound trauma that one can experience. So if reincarnation is true, it would mean that one trauma followed another directly in this worldly existence. Consequently, it's understandable that recalling past lives is more challenging than retrieving buried childhood traumas or memories of accidents from this life. Having total recall of multiple lifetimes would be such a burden It would be overwhelming to have all of that memory to handle on a daily basis. It seems more reasonable to focus our energies on the work of this lifetime and allow past life information to manifest as intuitive impulses for us rather than as pure recollection, which could prove to be more distracting than helpful. One of the fundamental beliefs cherished by many witches is the notion that thought is creative. This idea, for many of us, is universally accepted on a practical level. For example, if I desire to build a house, I must first conceive the idea in my mind. Then I would proceed with creating blueprints, hiring contractors, and commencing construction. Witchcraft takes that concept of creative thought to the absolute, that thought is inherently creative at all times. Conversely, everything that exists was brought forth into being through thought. There's a natural process that many of us just take for granted. If I were to ask you to listen to a tape containing affirmations such as, I'm worthless, everyone despises me, I will die soon, I will always lack money, no matter what I do, I'm constantly sick, twice a day for 30 days, in addition to writing each of these sentences out 20 times a day, you'd probably refuse. Intuitively, you would recognize that thought is creative and that you don't want to manifest things like these ideas. Creative thought is a fundamental idea behind spellcasting. A spell is a traditional method of manifesting desired results in life through things like chants, affirmations, visualizations, and ritual gestures. It goes beyond simply lighting candles or burning incense for quick results. Effective spellcasting takes time, training, 
practice and artistry, which is, as a general rule, take responsibility for the conditions in their lives rather than blaming other people and external influences exclusively. There are no laws in witchcraft, no matter what anybody tells you. Witchcraft is too broad. No two witches follow the same craft in the same way. So even though what I'm telling you here are some general principles that I and many people like me follow, a lot of witches won't necessarily agree, and that's fine. And that's why nobody has the right nor the ability to speak for the craft as a whole. There's a common rule that everybody supposedly follows in the craft, and that is the witch's read. And it goes, eight words the witch's read fulfill, and it harm none, do what you will. So this principle is trying to reflect the idea of cause and effect or karma, and it's trying to say, do what you will, but don't harm anybody. You tend to reap what you sow. It's not because there's somebody up in the sky saying they did this, therefore they should get this. It's much more organic. Cause and effect is built into things. I don't need somebody to give me a rule like the witches read. I don't need that. And most witches don't need that. We don't need nannying. We don't need to be supervised. We have within our own selves the ability to have ethics, the ability to understand what's good and what's not good, what's helpful and what's not helpful. And so we can make our own choices without somebody giving us a rule. I agree that what you do to another, you're doing to yourself. It's not because of some sort of arbitrary religious law. It's because mind is mind. If I have a thought and I project that thought outward, that thought always comes back to me because where else would it go? It's in my mind. If I'm throwing ideas at somebody that are harmful, those thoughts affect me as well because they are in my mind. And the mind has this characteristic of expanding. They tend to grow and expand. That's why there's this idea that what you put out comes back to you multiplied. What you put out comes back to you threefold, or what you put out comes back to you ninefold, whatever they happen to be saying. And that is true, but it's not because it's going out and coming back. It just appears to be that way because that's how this physical universe is set up. It's a, The physical universe is a, a universe of duality. So you don't see the invisible and the visible together and how they, they work with one another. When you're working magic, you're working in the realm of thought, very focused, concentrated thought. And when you throw thought at a situation, that thought is still with you. It's not going to go anywhere. There's no place for it to go. It's your mind. So if you are using the power of thought to harm another person, it's not that you are a bad person and therefore you will be punished. It's that you touched a hot stove with your hand and because the stove is hot, it will burn you. It's just how it works. It's set up that way that what you think about expands, and then you experience it, regardless of whether you think you're able to project that thought outside of your mind or not, and not get the repercussions. You can't, because there's no place for it to go, because it's in your mind. It's very simple. Everything in the craft is actually really simple and very practical. Now, there are cases where we need to do things like binding spells to stop dangerous individuals. So in that regard, we have to ask ourselves, would we want to be stopped in the same manner if we were engaged in some sort of heinous act? We must take responsible for addressing these threats in our communities, in our lives, and sometimes, yes, using magic to stop them. On the other hand, just hexing people because they annoy us is a different matter. The craft is not about attacking people with our magic. And I don't like the word black magic because it implies the color black as being something negative. 
there's nothing wrong with any of the colors. But attack magic is akin to murder or assault. And it's something that we're all capable of. You're capable of assaulting somebody. You're capable of murdering somebody. It's just that most of us choose not to. (laughs) It's really that simple. Everybody's capable of it. I mean, there's nothing to say that you can't go buy a gun and shoot someone. right? You could do that. It's within the realm of what's possible for you. But you probably don't choose to do that. The same goes true with attack magic. Everybody's capable of it. But most of us don't do it. Magic is neutral. There's no such thing as black magic and white magic. There's no such thing as good magic and evil magic. It's just magic. What's good or evil is how you use it. Electricity isn't good or evil. You can use electricity to light up your home or to fry somebody in the electric chair. You could use water to quench your thirst wash your face, or drown someone. So it's not the magic that's good or evil. It's our use of it that is good or evil. And when I say good or evil, I'm talking about whether it's something that is bringing good into your life or or being used to assault another person. It's so important to understand that what we say and what we do and what we think really matters. We have personal impact on the lives of everyone around us, whether we know them or not. And similarly, what happens on the higher planes of thought do manifest in the experiences of our reality. So these basic concepts of the craft are here to just provide a foundation for a way of life that you can develop for yourself. Witches are always open to trying new things and new spells and new ways of thinking. We use everything we can that works for us. Remember that magic and witchcraft are not reserved for a select few. It's just inherent in the fabric of life itself. Witches just simply acknowledge and embrace magic. And the first five exercises that we're going to talk about right now are something that are going to help you to incorporate magic into your daily life right away. And it's something that we recommend that you do every day throughout the rest of your life in the craft. The first is that of consecrating your food. Most of us don't grow our own food or regularly hunt for our own food. So we've lost touch with the fact that our nourishment actually comes from the earth, not from the supermarket. Nowadays, eating's also become very rushed and we try to quickly finish it and go back to work or other important tasks. And as a result, we often eat in a state of chaos, frustration, and rush rather than focusing on nourishing our bodies and our minds. Another issue with modern eating habits is the way the food is produced. The meat industry lacks ethical treatments of livestock. The agricultural industry doesn't consider the harmful effects of hormones and pesticides on our health or our environment. On top of that, mealtime is often a source of frustration. We may have learned as children that we are not good enough unless we clean our plates. Oftentimes, dinner is where the family arguments arise. It's usually where we get the bad news is at dinner time. No wonder that fast food is so popular. We just want to get it over with as quickly as we can. But we have a technique to heal ourselves from all of these challenges by simply consecrating or blessing our food. We express gratitude to the goddess for the earth's power to grow the food. We thank the food itself for nourishing us. We release the tensions in our bodies and minds and truly enjoy our meals. All you have to do is just take a moment to sit with your food before you eat it, relax your body, feel the emotional connection to the food, mentally express thanks for this divine sacrament that is about to take place, say out loud or silently the words, blessed be. And this just means that you're blessing the food. You're blessing the God, you're blessing the goddess, you're blessing your body. You're blessing everything in the entire world. And as you eat, just savor each bite. Take your time and let your soul be nourished as well as your body. We're going to talk really quickly about the purification by the four elements. The first is water purification. Water purification is simply taking a warm bath. To enhance the effects of this purification, I recommend that you add some sea salt to your bath. And when you are in that bath, you want to take some deep breaths to relax your mind and body and let go of all tension. Uh, 
it's a good idea to try to submerge your head, and we say it at least seven times, and remain in that mineral bath for at least 20 minutes. And if you want to enhance that, you can add a tea made of hyssop to the bath, or you can add a little essential oil of hyssop and or lavender to the bath as a nice adjunct to the salt. If you don't have a bathtub and you still want to do the water purification, one way that you can do it in the shower is just to bring some sea salt, really finely ground salt, into the shower with you and put a little bit in your palm and scrub your body down with this before you rinse off. Not only is it a wonderful exfoliant, but it's a great way to have that spiritual purification element. Now, if you can't do that, one thing you can do is just visualize white light in the water that's coming out of the shower head and just not only see yourself being showered with water but with the white light that's inside of the water cleansing your aura completely another thing you can do if you like the idea of using either the lavender or hyssop is you can have a small spray bottle of distilled water with just a couple of drops of hyssop essential oil or lavender essential oil and spray yourself down once you're finished with your shower. You don't have to do all these purifications every day. Just try to do one a day. But if you like incense, you can use smoke to purify your body or smudge. So you just get some incense. You can either use incense charcoal from a metaphysical supply store, or you could light some uh, smudge stick and put it in a fireproof container and uh, place it on the floor. And make sure that it's got enough to protect any heat so you don't burn your carpet. So you light the incense and you allow it to start to smoke. Now some good options for incense like besides the sage would be frankincense, frankincense and myrrh, dragon's blood resin, or a blend of cedar, sage, lavender, sweetgrass, and tobacco are another formula that, that is popular. Whatever you're using, just place it into the incense burner. You can do it nude, but you don't have to be nude. You just walk around the smoking incense seven times, saying some sort of purification prayer like, may this smoke purify my aura and cleanse me. After you've done seven times around the incense, you walk over the incense three times to seal it. Every seven times around the incense, you feel like another layer of your aura is being penetrated. When you walk over that incense three times, you just feel like it's sealed, like you are purified. Another form of air purification is breathing. If you want to clean your aura, just sit down and do some deep conscious breathing. Notice your inhales and your exhales. With every inhale, breathe deeply, preferably in through the nose. And with every exhale, out through the mouth, just allow your body to relax. Keep your mind focused on that breath and imagine that you're breathing in large amounts of white light, cleaning your aura, cleaning out every energy system in your mind, body, and all your affairs. Earth purification is work. Remember that work is a form of worship, and it's important to find joy in what you do. If you're not enjoying your current job, focus on something in your job that you do like. Take a look at how you interact with your coworkers and strive to be a positive presence there. Make a list of your top 10 pleasures in life and explore ways to incorporate them into your life every day and even into your career if possible. You can do meaningful work, whether it's cleaning up a park, volunteering, supporting causes that resonate with you. Another earth purification is physical exercise. That can be yoga, it can be weightlifting, it can be a nice walk around the block, getting your heart rate up. That is a type of earth purification. And then finally, there's fire purification. Take some time, at least every so often, to sit near some fire. And it should be an actual flame. So it can be a bonfire, a campfire, a fireplace, or a candle flame. And you just look into the flame and take some deep breaths and imagine the fire melting away all tension in your body and mind. Sitting in the presence of fire for 20 minutes is amazing. Now, you can really kick that up a notch if you can spare like five hours or more every so often to sit in front of an open fire. 
That's amazing if you can do that. Maybe a campfire, a fireplace, a bonfire, but even just a little candle every so often is a great tool. And and working with at least one of these spiritual purification techniques a day is amazing. So your assignment for this week is to consecrate your food at least one time this week, if you can't remember to do it every time, and find one purification technique that you like, and you do at least one a day if you can. And just start to notice the difference in the way you feel about your body, your aura, and your, your life, and get ready to start on your magical path. Thank you so much for joining me today for this introduction to our revisiting of a witch's primer. I hope you enjoyed it, and I can't wait for our next lesson. Until next time, blessed be. Thank you.